Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome and thanks for finding the time to join me here as I'll, I'll try to talk about architects and materials. Uh, as George said, I'm Dennis Kochman, I'm here at ETH and uh, in the Mechanics and Materials Lab, we try to look into why materials the way they behave and how we can use that knowledge to make new materials with interesting properties. And without further ado, let's, let's dive into it. What are architected materials? Materials, as we know them, classically derive their properties from composition and microstructure. So if you zoom into lower scales, you will find grain networks, dislocations, or polymer chains, or whatnot. And these small scale composition and microstructural features give rise to microscale properties. So if you take your sample and you pull on it, you're going to get mechanical properties. And this means stress strain data, or for example, Young's modulus, the stiffness. If you map it in all directions, we call this the stiffness map that looks like that. And there is a key relation between microstructure and properties as we know it from undergraduate mechanics and materials classes. Now, architected materials, or some people call them metamaterials, to me that's a matter of semantics, of course have similar principles, but their uh, general makeup is quite different. Architected materials derive their properties primarily from structural architecture. So if we zoom in, and this is shown in the cartoon over here, we're not necessarily going to find what we typically find in materials, but we'll see structural architecture. And that could be trusses as shown over here, could be plates, could be shells. It's a structure that we find at an intermediate level, way above the you know, grain dislocation, whatever network of the base material, but well below the macroscopy scale of our application. And now again, of course, if you pull on this, we can again map mechanical properties, stress strain data, stiffness, strength, impact absorptions, toughness, you name it. And the key of the game, the end goal here is to find the structure property map, to understand how microstructure on the one hand gives rise to properties on the other hand. And not only to understand this link, but to deliberately and intelligently use that link to make new architectures that give rise to microscopic properties of interest. Now, what we'll be talking today a lot about is the base material versus the effective material. And whenever I speak about the base material, that is really the material out of which these structures over here are being made. It could be a polymer, it could be a ceramic, it could be a metal, it could be a composite. And this material has certain properties. And these are the base material properties. On the other hand, they're also what I refer to as effective material properties. And effective material properties are those ones that we observe if we take the structure at a much larger scale and object that uh, subject that to you know, loading of any sort. And these are the effective properties. One effective property that's generally very important is what we call the density or the relative density, which is nothing else but the fill fraction. In other words, how much of the volume is filled with a solid. If you had a monolithic material, that would be one or 100%. If we remove more and more material to come up with these cellular architectures, that number quickly decreases from one to zero. And so the relative density is some number between zero and one that tells us how much material we have filled into the volume. And now by the end of the day, we want the effective properties of our material here. And these effective mechanical properties could be anything, stiffness, strength, toughness, impact absorption. And these effective properties are now of course a function of the base material properties up here, but at the same time, they're also a function of architecture. And whenever I say architecture, what I mean is the topology. How do you connect beams or, uh, or, or, or trusses or plates or shells? And the geometry, what's the cross section? How do we exactly map the geometry of the architectural features? And it is exactly this relation between architecture and effective mechanical properties that we try to understand. And that's the structure property map that was mentioned earlier. And to give you a very simple analogy, you know, it's pretty much the same as the QR codes that we all know. This QR code over here encodes somehow a URL, a link. You take a picture and this one over here brings you to a beautiful website. Um, but basically inside the pixels over here is encoded the information of the URL of the link. If you change any of the pixels, they may lead you somewhere else or it may lead you to nonsense. It's exactly the same thing here. Architecture is what defines the properties. The moment you change the architecture, you also change the properties or you may even get nonsensical architectures and hence bad or boring properties or useless properties to come out. Now, what do typical architects and materials look like? They could depend on trusses, as I was just showing you. They could depend on plates, as we see in this example here. They could depend on shelves, as we see at the bottom. There's really, the sky is the limit. You can design anything and put it together, for example, in this periodic fashion. There are many examples, now I have to hide uh, behind these examples, because I'm gonna show so many. Uh, of course, you can get fancy and do all kinds of things. Over here, this is old work done with Julia Greer's team, where we looked into hierarchical architectures, beams made out of beams out of beams, very low density, but interesting properties. Let's get rid of this. 
Here uh, you can see woven architectures, also among others from Julia Rear's team, where these woven architectures give very uh, interesting properties in terms of, for example, friction and energy absorption. And then finally, over here, we have plate-based architectures, some of the stiffest uh, designs uh, reported to date by my ETH colleague, Dirk Mohr. And then, of course, besides architectures, there are also many material properties where you can play with because the base material changes. Up here is an example of a pyrolyzed polymer, which in the end produces a sample that's composed entirely out of carbon. Down here, you see lithiated silicon, which basically is a 3D printed battery, if you will. Or, of course, there's plenty of polymers that can be printed at very low weight in the end to produce interesting solutions, not only for packaging, but also for energy absorption and so forth. What's critical to those is that, of course, we can also produce them at very small, a small scale. This is an example from our collaborator at Caltech, Julia Greer. And if you look at the scale bar down here, the entire structure is only on the order of 120 to 150 microns. These are tiny. If you look at them with the naked eye, you don't even see structure anymore. It's really a piece of material. And this is exactly where this differentiation between material and structure starts to dissolve when we talk about architectural materials. Just to make sure we understand, this is a human hair on the same scale as what you see on the left. So these are absolutely tiny features. And now you can imagine if you make a structure of this type, place it over here, and now you simply make your unit cell smaller and smaller and smaller. By the end of the day, you approach an effective continuum. And that effective continuum will have properties that depend on the architecture, but you don't see structural features anymore. And so the two questions that we try to answer as, as modelers and theoreticians are number one, how do we extract effective properties from a known architecture? And that's what I refer to as forward homogenization. But then we also want to go the inverse route, which means if you hand me any material properties that you want, you know, ideal combinations of stiffness, strength, or whatnot, how can we find an architecture that has exactly those target properties? And that's what I refer to as the inverse homogenization. And this, of course, is a big challenge for theory and simulations. Now, how do we do this? What we classically do is what we know as homogenization. We try to separate the large scale from the small scale. We try to look for the large scale properties. We're zooming in at, I've heard, unit cell at the small scale, which you call the micro scale. And we try to separate the scales. We try to understand the large scale properties by homogenizing, by smearing out the features from the small scale. I'm not going to go into the details of the methods behind this because there are so many. And our lab uh, over the years has worked on many of the techniques to investigate this macro to micro transition. There are analytical and computational homogenization techniques. There are techniques where you have to perform simulations on two scale, like an epi square. The quasi continuum method tries to bridge between effective continuum and discrete calculations. Uh, for dynamical problems, there's block wave analysis, nonlinear analysis, ray tracing. I'll show some of this later. Many of these techniques are out there. The real question I want to address today is what can we do with that? And this is what I hopefully I want to excite you about. What kind of properties, what kind of principles are of interest when we talk about architectural materials? And so here I'm going to talk about stiffness, impact absorption, reconfigurability, wave guidance, toughness, strength, spatial grading, and hopefully we'll get time for the inverse design towards the end. <clears throat> and so let's dive right into the, this and let's see where these architectural materials could be of interest to you or to, to us in general. Let's start with stiffness. These architectures can be made in all kinds of form. Here you see just four examples. Again, this is a collaboration from a longer time ago with Julia Beer's lab. And four different architectures here were produced. First, of course, computationally designed and then printed. And one of the things I'd like to point out is the amazing uh, accuracy with which these can be printed nowadays at small scales. Each of the left images shows you a CAT drawing. Each of the right images shows you an SEM image. And it's intriguing to what accuracy you can make these structures nowadays. Now, when you make these structures and eventually you hold them in your hands, you can perform experiments. You take them and you, for example, perform uniaxial compression tests. You measure the load and the uh, change in strain. And from that, you extract, for example, your Young's modulus. That's what it referred to as stiffness. And if you take all kinds of architectures, and this is a comparison we did a long time ago, again, with Julia's team here, and we look at all kinds of architectures, what you find is that here is Young's modulus of those. On this axis, you see the mass density of those. We're going to populate a very wide space. The bulk material, for example, alumina, that's a ceramic, which is often used for these materials, is up here. The bulk polymer for polymer samples is up here. And then, of course, as you remove material and you make the cellular solids lighter and lighter, you're going to go down, both in density, but also in modulus. 
What's interesting is let's take those and compare them to materials we classically find in literature. So what you see on the left is a typical SP chart of stiffness, Young's modulus versus mass density. Again, of very many uh, well-known natural or synthetic materials. And if we compare these two, we're going to find interesting uh, conclusions. First of all, let's identify these points on the left. So bulk alumina, the red dot, is up there. And bulk polymer, the blue dot, is somewhere in the middle. I hope you can see the black and the blue dot as they appear. This is the bulk material, and we know those. What we do now is we take the bottom ends of these two curves, the red and the, uh, the green square, and add them to the left. And what do you see then? Let me move this over for better visibility is that while the polymer samples in green follow very much the trend of where we classically expect foams down here, the ceramic ones show something interesting. You can, of course, reduce a lot your modulus from bulk alumina to down here. We are cutting down in stiffness by orders of magnitude. But if you look at the relative stiffness versus density, we actually see that these samples fall into a regime where there was previously white space. They're above the foams. They're orders of magnitude stiffer or can be orders of magnitude stiffer than foams, while at the same time having relatively low density. And so this is the, the ultimate goal of the game when you make these structures, that you try to populate as much of the white space in these diagrams as possible so that we can actually find samples at low weight, but much higher stiffness than what's classically out there. In this case, for example, made out of a ceramic, which has interesting other applications as opposed to the classical polymeric foams. Of course, stiffness is just one simple example of what these materials do. Um, the mechanical response of the samples is a lot richer. And so one thing I wanted to highlight is if you take these samples and you deform them, I have one in my hands over here. This is a polymer one. If I deform it, we see that the deformation is not only nonlinear, but it's also heavily time dependent. If I deform this and I let go, you can actually observe in real time how long it takes for the sample to reach its original state. And that's because this comes with a nonlinear deformation, but also with viscoelastic time-dependent deformation. Capturing this is a lot harder in simulations, but also in experiments, than the linear stiffness, but it's possible. And so what you see here on the left and right is just one comparison where on the left, we simulate a discrete truss containing about 9 million truss members and taking eight hours to calculate. On the right is a homogenized continuum. And this homogenized continuum is essentially a very efficient large-scale FE calculation, just 10 by 10 by 10 elements. But at every point, uh, quadrature point, we have to evaluate the constitutive model. We go low, we go down to the lower scale. We look at an individual unit cell and try to affect the effective behavior in an FE square type fashion. FE square is generally very expensive. For these trusses, it's not because every unit cell contains only very few degrees of freedom. So here we can cut from eight hours to 20 minutes calculation time by going this homogenization route and capturing the nonlinear behavior. What's that good for? Well, I showed you earlier the large time dependent deformation and one typical application is impact absorption. And so if you take, for example, this what I'm showing you over here, we have a lattice, a truss lattice at the bottom and we're dropping a ball onto those. On the left is the experiment, in the middle is the simulation, on the right is the homogenized continuum. If you play this and you drop the ball, what's gonna happen, of course, is gonna impact the surface, it's gonna interact with the sample, Viscoelasticity plays a major role and the sample lifts off again. And by the way, I'm extremely sorry I forgot to mention this. What I'm showing you here is work by a lot of people and usually in the top right corner over here, I try to highlight those who are responsible for simulations and experiments. So sorry, the most important point here is that we can capture the impact behavior, for example, by these continuum simulations very, very efficiently. And so we can measure, for example, optically, the displacement of the ball as it comes in. We can measure the velocity as it switches direction. And what you see here are comparisons of experiment, of a discrete calculation, and of the continuum model. And they seem to be matching uh, magically, not just for the bitruncated octahedron cell down here, but for example, also for the octahedron and others. So what we do here is we try to go from a discrete structure to an effective homogenized continuum. And then we use that knowledge to induce interesting behavior in order to use high impact energy absorption, for example, directional absorption and so forth. What is that good for? Well, one application is classically protection. This could be shoe insoles. It could be personal protection. It could be sports gear. For all those where you need an impact energy absorption uh, in, a, in a dedicated, possibly even personal or patient-specific fashion. And we do work with industrial collaborators here whose name I'm not supposed to mention, uh, but who work exactly in this direction. Another thing you can also do is you can get unusual behavior. The word metamaterials often refers to unusual extreme behavior. So here's just one example from the lab where we designed a sample at the bottom 
which is not periodic, but spatially graded. As you can see, the size of the units cell varies from one end to another. And the outcome of this is relatively simple. You drop a ball, but the sample is not going to respond in the same way with all of the unit cells. And as a consequence of that, you get directional behavior. So the ball that drops from above is ejected to the side. You can even exploit viscoelasticity, in which case you can you know, make the direction depend on the impact speed and other uh, parameters. So you can make a mechanical sorting machine. If you drop it, you know, the response will be in a different direction based on from where and how you drop it and so forth. And so this is a great example for where you can use architecture and insight into how architecture makes properties to design effective material behavior. Of course, one can also go a lot further with these nonlinear applications here. Nonlinear large deformation is something we explored a while ago uh, together with Katia Bertoldi, Jennifer Lewis, Jochen Müller, uh, many others. You can see the pictures up here and Romic from my own team. And the idea here is that you design systems that respond to your stimulus. So if you take this one over here and you punch it, for example, what's going to happen is that this architecture transforms. And it transforms without any electricity, without actuation or sensing, which is great for the applications uh, that we classically find in soft robotics. So let's play this once more. What you observe, oops, sorry. Ah. This is when you try things for the first time. So it's supposed to play, but it doesn't. Anyways, um, this transformation, where does it come from? It has a very simple, again, architectural idea. These designs that you have here have two stable configurations of the unit cell. They have an open configuration, which is strained, and they have a closed configuration, which is unstrained. If you then look at the energy profile of this unit cell being opened up slowly, it has a stable energy minimum at zero strain, and it has a second stable minimum at the maximum strain over here of 0.3. And so if you start in this configuration and you provide a mechanical stimulus, the sample will want to float into the other minimum. And that's exactly what happens here. And this is how you can design these soft robots uh, that mechanically sends a stimulus and respond. Here's another example of uh, a, a long chain of these open and closed architectures lying on the table. And the moment you punch it, it's going to move. And so here, a simple punch goes over into locomotion. You can have samples that slide over the table. Again, going from open to closed is a very simple design principle. What I particularly like about this is that there is a one-to-one -one analogy to phase transformations. If you think about classical crystalline materials, the phase transformation means nothing else, but there are two stable configurations and there is a stimulus induced path from one to the other. And that's exactly what we see here as well, <clears throat> which is great because this means many of the theories and applications we know from phase transformations, we can now also use, for example, in understanding the structural transformation of these solids. And there really is a wide open architectural design space. We've worked on this in 2D, in 3D, uh, we've tried to come up with interesting uh, novel applications for uh, you know, reconfiguration, morphing structures, uh, locomotion, like in this example, and so forth. Now, speaking about wave motion, uh, there's something specific that is very interesting about these architectural materials. We don't even have to go all the way to nonlinear, and that's what I want to show you next. If you take any object and you hit it, you will see waves moving. And if you look at a linear elastic medium, and let's say it's isotropic, you hit it, and waves will spread radially. They spread in all directions if it's an isotropic medium. If it's an anisotropic medium, meaning there's some directional dependence on the material properties, such as stiffness or density, you will see anisotropic wave motion. Wave will spread in all directions, but possibly different speeds in different directions. If you have an architected material, there's more to it, because that architected material has architecture on a smaller scale. And so as a consequence, what you can see is either that waves are attenuated and die out completely, or you can produce directional wave motion, meaning you can actually see what's shown in this cartoon over here, that waves do propagate in some directions, but not in others. How is this possible? It's actually, it's intrinsic in the nature of having a lower scale architecture, because there are two phenomena which you cannot see in a homogeneous medium, which you do find in architected materials. Number one, there's local resonance. Each and every strut, can be excited into resonance because this length scale L over here exists, which, is, which does not necessarily exist in a homogeneous medium. And when you hit resonance, these elastic or viscoelastic vibrations, depending on the base material, can absorb a lot of energy. And the second point is scattering. If you think about a homogeneous medium, wave and hence energy can flow in all directions uniformly, more or less. If you talk about a discrete truss, like in this case over here, energy can only flow along the discrete path that is given by the truss architecture. And as a consequence, interesting things can happen if, for example, energy and, and waves move you know, along two discrete paths, but meet again, they can annihilate if they're off in phase. 
And so based on the frequency of excitation, you can get these annihilation paths, which basically means that there are certain directions into which waves are attenuated to specific frequencies. And that's known as Bragg scattering in this, in this context. So let's get rid of this. Um, now, if we do this in the lab, we can actually try it experimentally to see if we observe such behavior. And what you see here is a very simple, ex well, it's not very simple, I take that back. These gentlemen are gonna disagree with me. It's not a simple experiment. What we do is we take a 2D sheet, which has the architecture of this uh, rectangular uh, cross section, it's in 2D, and we excite it with a shaker in out of plane motion. And we basically give it either harmonic or a sweep a kind of excitation at one or more frequencies. And then we're gonna observe what happens. And the observation is done with a laser Doppler vibrometer, which looks at the sheet up here and measures the out of plane uh, displacement deflection of the sheet. And what we get then are typical images, which look like what you can see here in the middle, shown here is a velocity profile in the XY plane, and the color code is the, is the amplitude. So if you excite the system, what you will find is that waves spread. And they spread not in a radial simple fashion, but in a very complex state. In fact, I look, this looks like these, these beautiful window decorations people put up for Christmas. Um, in fact, this is nothing else but waves spreading in 2D because of the excitation for a certain range of frequencies. If you want to understand what happens here is, of course, you need a bit of theory. I don't want to go through all the details, but the theory behind this is that of block wave analysis and dispersion relations. In a nutshell, what we do is we assume a traveling wave solution of the type up here, which means we have a displacement field U, which propagates as a so-called block wave. E to the I, Kx minus omega t is the important part, which means we're looking at waves that spread as a plane in a certain direction, K, and at a frequency, omega. And this is nothing else but a block wave propagating in a certain direction, k, as shown in the schematic up here, and a frequency omega. What we'd like to do is understand how at a given frequency these directions evolve. And this is the typical plot that we generate computationally. This is known as dispersion surfaces. So if you pick your k vector in the 2D plane, you want to investigate wave motion in a particular direction, then this plane will tell you the frequency at which waves move into that direction. And so if you pick any point in the bottom plane, this constitutes a 2D wave factor. If you then move up until you hit the blue surface, this will tell you on that axis the frequency at which the wave will move in this direction. What's specific about these trusses is that they can deform in many ways. And this, for example, is what we know as the lowest mode. It's an out of plane mode. And if you excite the structure, this eigenmode will spread in all sorts of directions at the frequency shown over here. There are many more modes. This is the first in-plane mode. What we see here again is for every K vector, we find a unique frequency, and this is an in-plane vibrational mode moving. You can throw in more and more modes and you get a complete picture of this dispersion relation diagram. But what it tells you essentially is that if you pick any point again in the K space at the bottom and you move up, then each intersection where you pinch, uh, pinch uh, through one of the surfaces tells you a frequency at which you're gonna propagate in these directions. Now, how is this related to reality? If we go back to the experiment I was showing you before, we can take this velocity data down here and simply, quote unquote, perform an FFT. What we're trying to do is establish the K vectors and the frequencies associated with that plot down there. And that's exactly what I'm showing you up here. I'll play the movie in just a second. But what you will see is that as we increase the frequency, you will see different wave vectors becoming effective. The low frequency, it's pretty much circular because waves will propagate in all directions equally. But as the frequency increases, waves start to move only in particular directions. And this is what you see here is the bright spots in this diagram showing the amplitude of the wave modes and frequency space. You can go up to higher and higher frequencies. You can see more and more beautiful patterns appear until finally you, know, you hit the resolution and error limit uh, of, of the experimental setup. Now, how is this related to what I was just showing you before? This I can show in a very simple comparison of simulation of the experiments. So let's stop this one over here and let's see how it's related to, to uh, the computations. What you see on the left for this particular lattice that we're testing in the lab, that's the dispersion surface diagram. And what you see again is for every K vector, you see the frequencies at which it is being active. And what we're doing now is over here is we're fixing a particular frequency and we're slowly moving up in frequency. That means nothing else, but we're starting at the top, uh, at the bottom. And we're slowly moving up to higher and higher frequencies. And at every frequency, we look at the K vectors which are active. And what this looks like is this. So if I stop it right here, we have moved up from zero to this plane. The intersection with the red surface is pretty much a circle, which you see here in red. And behind this in gray, you see what we picked up in the experiment. And if I now play this for the full range of frequencies, you can see that there's a beautiful match 
uh, to our own surprise, it works beautifully between what we see in the experiment and what the simulations predict. So we can very, very well for any frequency tell what the typical modes are that are propagating and what frequencies and what directions they should be propagating. And of course, the end game here again is that not just radial motion, but you can use architecture to tune what you see over here. Here's a simple comparison where we just modify the unit cell from a square to a rectangle to a rectangle with an even larger aspect ratio. And what this does, it allows us to tune the dispersion relations dramatically. You can make dispersion relations that move only in particular directions. You can make dispersion relations which completely block waves in some directions, but not in others. And can use it to tune waves as they move through the sample. I'll show you one more example towards the end, but take my word for it that we can use this to not only understand what we see in the lab, but of course we can also use this to tune the dispersion relations and hence to tune and control the wave motion uh, by you know, controlling the dispersion relations through architecture again. Now, it's pretty much half time. Um, and I promised I would talk about a lot of examples. We talked about stiffness and how extreme stiffness at low density can be achieved. I touched upon nonlinear deformation and how impact absorption is one of the potential avenues. I talked about reconfigurable morphing and locomoting, is that a word, uh, samples. I talked about wave guidance and how these architectures give rise to properties we would not see in homogeneous solids simply because the architecture matters as it interacts with the wave. There are a few more properties and, and problems I quickly like to touch upon. And the first one is toughness. So far, we only talked about samples that remain intact. But of course, you know, in any real world scenario, they will fail at some point. And toughness or the resistance to, to fracture propagation is one of the things that has caught attention for quite a while. In continuum mechanics, fracture toughness is well understood. You have a sample, you put a crack or a notch in, you pull on it, for example, in mode one loading, and you observe what happens. And at some point, the loading is large enough so it fails. And this, in a way, defines a critical value. We have our K1C value, the critical fracture toughness that's being used to define uh, you know, the, the toughness of, of a 2D medium. In an elastic solid, we know that the stress you know, uh, diverges uh, at the crack tip, but we can use that divergence to understand the K1, the fracture toughness, and related to K1C. For anything that's not elastic, there's usually a process zone ahead of the crack tip, and this process zone can also be linked to the fracture toughness. But now all of a sudden we have discrete truss lens. What changes? What changes is that in the effective medium far away, we can still use all these techniques I showed you. We go from a discrete structure to a continuum, get its effective properties and be happy. But at the crack tip, it's not a continuous medium. It's a discrete truss. And that means you're not going to look at a effective continuum where stresses rise, but you have a discrete arrangement of trusses. And based on which truss reaches the highest stress first, that's the one that fails, and that's the one that determines fracture toughness. And so we cannot work with classical continuum theories to, to the widest extent, but we have to take the discrete structure into account. And that's what we do when I talk about quasi-continuum modeling. So there the idea is that in the far field over here, we can still work with the effective continuum, but at the crack tip, we need full resolution. We need to be able to model each and every strut in order to figure out which one has the highest load. And so what we would do is we take a sample, we load it, for example, in mode one loading by remotely applying stresses with a pre-existing crack, and we look at how stresses are distributed. And what's interesting here, again, is that architecture, oops, I need to move on the picture, um, has a tremendous impact here. What you see on the left is the so-called Kagomi lattice, on the right is a triangular lattice. And what you see is the stress distribution inside the struts as we apply the exact same load remotely. But the response is very, very different. Why is that? Well, it's because these two different architectures respond very differently to the same uh, remotely applied loading. So here in these two insets, you can in fact see the architecture, the Kagomi and the triangular lattice. And you can see that while on the left, the stress intensity at the crack tip is deflected into these long bands, it is blunted essentially, it's, it's spread over a wide region. On the right, it's only two or three struts that carry the maximum load, which of course, as a consequence, will fail early on. And so here it is the architecture which tremendously matters when it comes to fracture toughness. And we cannot think about effective continuum elasticity anymore. We have to take the discreteness into account. This becomes even clearer when we look at the effect of fracture toughness. So what we do here is we in fact take one of these samples, we make them very large, apply remote loading, and check at what point the first stress, the first strut near uh, the crack tip reaches a critical load, the failure stress sigma f. And then we can calculate a fracture toughness. In these samples, fracture toughness K1C or K2C, K2C, they typically scale with the relative density of the sample. 
the lower the density, the lower the fracture toughness, with the critical stress and also with the character side length of the trusses. This is another point where architecture matters because the side length enters directly. What you see here is a plot of fracture toughness versus relative density compared to some literature data uh, for the triangular lattice. I can also show you more examples. Here's mode two loading for the triangular lattice. Here's mode two loading. One of the things that's very interesting here is if you look at the two pictures in the middle and on the right, these are exactly the same lattices and they're loaded in exactly the same fashion, both mode two loading, both a triangular lattice. And the triangular lattice in particular is elastically isotropic. So we shouldn't see any strong directional dependence. Yet, the only difference between the two is that the crack is oriented differently with respect to the triangular arrangement. And because of the crack arrangement, we have a very different appearance in the fracture toughness, which means here it's not only architecture that matters and the size that matters, it's even the orientation of the pre-existing crack with respect to the architecture that tremendously affects the properties. And this is an interesting observation because it means we have to be very careful of how to interpret fracture toughness. We need to look not only at architecture, but even at the orientation of the existing cracks. Now, one thing that all of these models have in common is we typically assume that it's a strut. It's a beam that fails when the stress reaches a certain threshold. That's unfortunately not what's true and what we see in most experiments because there's a dark side of trusses and also plates. I've been talking about trusses a lot, but this dark side is that they have junctions. And anyone who studies undergraduate mechanics understands that if you put two beams together, the junction is a point of stress concentration where you will find hot spots in the stresses shown here in red. And because of these stress concentrations, you will see micro cracking to happen primarily at the nodes. It's further very sensitive to imperfections and it leads to a low resilience, meaning if you start loading your sample, these nodes are going to fail very early on. And that's a bad feature of these truss and plate based designs. Now, if you think about natural architectures, nature doesn't use trusses and plates. Of course, nature doesn't have 3D printers, uh, but nature also has different design principles. Here you see examples of bone, of bamboo, of tissue. In all of those, there are no junctions or no sharp corners at all. And that has a reason. It's not only better you know, to avoid uh, cracking and failure, but it's also the process of how these are made. In nature, these, these, these samples are being made by processes like self-assembly growth or spinodal decomposition. What I'm depicting here is a very simple chemical process of spinodal decomposition. Imagine you are mixing two fluids, oil and water, or uh, you take liquids, uh, silver and gold, you put them together, but these two want to separate. They're immiscible, and what happens over time is that the two phases separate until you finally reach a state where oil and black and water and white have separated into structures of this type. If you now remove all the water or all the oil, by putting a threshold onto this, let's say we remove all uh, the white, uh, the, the, the black space, what's left is a cellular architecture. And this is basically what we then observe as these typical architectures I just showed you. What we realized a few years ago, and this has been known uh, since the 60s from Khan, is that if we want to understand these structures, we don't really have to simulate the whole process because these architectures here stem from what's known as the Gaussian random field. If you generate this thing over here, this gives you a phase field phi, which is one if you're in the white phase, which is zero if you're in the black phase, and you know, which is between zero and one if you're in the interface. And we can use this very effectively to describe these types of architectures. This is the natural process. And in this case, these n's over here are random wave factors. And these wave factors are essentially, we realize that if we tune them and don't make them random, we get interesting architectures. If this was a bit quick, let me quickly introduce this uh, in a simple example. If this is a Gaussian random field, then what these n vectors effectively do is they determine the direction perpendicular to which material wants to grow. So if I take only one n vector, I would get a laminate with faces are parallel to the vector. If I take two vectors, material wants to align perpendicular to the two. And if we choose these vectors, for example, from some cone angles in 3D, we can get interesting architectures. Let's say we take only two of these cone angles. And in this case, our wave factors are of course not isotropic random anymore, but they're aligned. But what happens is material wants to align perpendicular to those. You get a columnar structure, which is very stiff in this direction and very soft in the other directions. That's the elastic stiffness block. If you take all three cone angles, material wants to grow in all three directions equally, you get what we call a cubic structure. And the stiffness map looks like that. And finally, if you take only one of these cone angles, you get something that's close to a laminate. Not exactly a laminate, but close to it. And the effect of stiffness is pancaking. Stiff in these two directions, but very soft in the third direction. 
And these samples we can, you know, computationally construct. And then luckily we collaborate uh, with great people at Caltech here. It's again, Julia Greer's team and Carlos Portela who can make these samples. They print them out of polymer. This is what happens if you zoom in in SEM. You can see these little cubes appear. And after printing the polymer, they coat them with alumina, with the ceramic. And at the end, they can even etch out the polymer. And what's left with are these very thin shells of alumina that were coated on top of the polymeric skeleton. And these are the typical structures that you obtain from this. <clears throat> what's special about these structures? There are two things. The first one is, if you look carefully, we've gotten rid of pretty much all sharp junctions. That is because this phase separation process is driven by surface energy and surface energy does not like sharp junctions. So we have a smooth architecture over here. And if you run simple FE calculations, all the stress concentrations from the strut have disappeared. So you have an architecture that's pretty much free of, of sharp junctions, of sharp uh, peaks in, this, in the stress that you observe. There's another nice consequence because Carlos and Julia seem, <clears throat> they've made this at uh, very, very small scales. There are certain size effects that kick in. Now, what you see here is one example of one of these structures being taken and compressed vertically up to 25% strain. I'm just going to play the movie. On the left is the sample. On the right, you can see the stress strain curve. And the one thing you notice is that you can load this thing, you unload it, but as you unload it, there's pretty much no residual damage left. It just returns to almost zero strain as if nothing happened. You try it a second time, small changes. You try it a third time, small changes. And now keep in mind, this is alumina, meaning this is a ceramic, a purely ceramic particle uh, sample. Try doing this at home with your favorite base, or better don't do it. So I would guarantee um, you know, this is not going to work. And there are three things at play here. The first one is we have no stress concentrations, as I just pointed out. The second one, which I can't talk much about, is there are also material intrinsic size effects, because we make these really, really thin shells. They're pretty much free of any pre existing cracks. The wall thickness here is on the order of just 20 nanometers or so, where you have material size effects, and they give rise to the fact that pretty much nothing fails. And third, what you really see here is elastic shell buckling. So we've designed a system which undergoes large compressive deformation through buckling instead of through damage, through crashing, through crushing uh, contact, and so forth. And again, it's the architecture which, along with, of course, uh, sophisticated fabrication route um, gives rise to interesting material behavior. <clears throat> now, the last point on the agenda that I wanted to talk about is the inverse design. And this is a very special field, which I would say in recent years has benefited tremendously from the advent of machine learning and neural nets. And uh, this is primarily a collaboration with Sid Kumar now at TU Delft. Um, and here we try to go the inverse route, which means if you hand me properties you want, I'm supposed to find a structure which has those properties. Everything I've been telling you so far was forward. We come up with an interesting design, interesting architecture, and then let's see what the properties are. Here, we try to do exactly the opposite. And how does that work? <clears throat> let's imagine you take all the trust networks you've ever studied, and let's say you connect them to their properties. For example, you take these trust networks and you look at their effective stiffness. And again, these colorful clouds here are nothing else but the effect of stiffness in all directions in 3D, right? Now, what we've been doing the whole time is the forward homogenization route. I have an architecture, what are the properties? And how to do this, I try to cover through a homogenization, basically looking at a unit cell extracting effective properties. What we wanna do now is the opposite. What's the inverse design avenue that we can, can go? How can we go from designed, desired properties, desired properties to a given architecture? And now this inverse design challenge has one flaw, which is uh, something that's in the nature of how this inverse design challenge is, is, is made. Imagine that you have a gazillion trusses and you know their effective stiffnesses. Of course, what you could do is try to find a sample which is close to your you know, beneficial properties, but this is not only inefficient, it also doesn't interpolate well. Meaning, you know, if you're missing the one architecture that has your properties, there's no guarantee you're gonna find one in your set that has exactly what you want. But now imagine you have all this data. The challenge we're going to pose is that if you give me a query, if you tell me I want this and this degree of stiffness, I am supposed to generate somehow through a black box the output. And it's supposed to be as close as possible to that. And of course, we can do this not only for trusses, we can also do this for the spinodal architectures. We can do it for many other things, as long as there's a clear parametrization of the design. As long as we know how to describe the architecture, this in principle is, you know, a, looks like a well-posed problem. Why does it not work? For the following reason. 
let's say we are playing dumb and we want to devise uh, a neural network, a machine learning problem, which for any stiffness you hand me, throws out a certain topology, which is as close as possible to that stiffness. We have a large training set, so we have topology and stiffness data. We want the machine learning to minimize this, which is if you hand me a stiffness Y, I'm supposed to find a topology X so that the distance to the original topology of that stiffness is minimized. That looks simple. And uh, you, know, you could try to, to learn a, a network with this, but the problem is that this doesn't work because the inverse problem is inherently ill-posed. Why? Because many different topologies may have the same or similar stiffness. The training set that you introduced here could contain many samples that show exactly the same stiffness, especially for trusses. It's very easy to generate isotropic stiffness with very many different designs. Therefore, it's ill-posed. I cannot minimize the distance between the two architectures because it's not even clear which architecture to compare to. So what we did then is a very simple, uh, but clever trick. We never compare topologies. Instead, we compare only properties. If you hand me a target stiffness you want, I'll try to find a topology whose effective stiffness is as close as possible to the one that you give me. This is a well-posed comparison because this is nothing else but the norm of, of two tensors that we must compare over here. And this is relatively uh, easy to do. We don't have to compare topologies to stiffnesses. So this inverse problem where we try to minimize the distance, not between topologies, but between stiffnesses, this is well-posed, but it's also very expensive because every time I'm trying to find a topology for you, I have to do a homogenization to extract the effective stiffness. And I have to do this many, many, many times. So how do we get out of this? The, same, the simple trick is replace this FEM homogenization down here. And the way we did it is through a pre-trained homogenization approximator, which means we first learn a network which tries to understand the forward homogenization approach. And this one is relatively easy to train. We use our training data to understand how we can go from topology to effective stiffness. And we train this network independently beforehand. Once this network exists, the forward homogenization can efficiently be handled by this network. And then we introduce the second network, which tries to do exactly what we said before, namely try to minimize the distance between two stiffnesses. So if you hand me now a stiffness, I'm supposed to find a topology whose efficiently homogenized stiffness matches yours. And this problem is not only well posed, it's also very efficient because of the shortcut over here. What is this good for? I'll show you one application example that we've looked into and SID is continuously looking into, uh, which is bone implants. These implants are typically made from titanium or steel, which is a lot stiffer than the actual human bone. And this leads to stress shielding, uh, which is due to the stiffness mismatch between bone and implant. It can lead to atrophy, long-term incompatibility, uh, removal of implants and whatnot. It's, it's quite bad. One of the issues is that if you look at the variability of the bone density and stiffness from patient to patient, or even from spot to spot within the same bone, and varies dramatically. What you see in this histogram down here is, for example, how the relative density or the maximum Young's modulus varies from bone sample to bone sample. And therefore, if you could make an implant that as smoothly as possible, you know, matches the stiffness as closely as possible, matches the stiffness of the pre-existing bone, that would be tremendous. And that's exactly what we do with our network. So you start with a bone sample and you measure its 3D stiffness. Luckily, this was done for us in literature. And then we try to crunch this through our neural network. And what it does is it spits out not one, but two or more topologies. Here we inserted that we want this to be made of titanium, which means the relative density is going to be much lower than that of natural bone, only 3%, 3.4, 3.5. And we generate two networks over here whose effective stiffness closely mimics the one that we put in. Down here, you can see three cross sections of the 3D stiffness plot in the three principal planes. So you can see a comparison of the target in green and the two predictions in blue and in orange. You can see that's almost a perfect match. Of course, this is not a lucky coincidence. You do it for a different sample. Here's another one, completely different 3D uh, stiffness. And again, the neural networks in this case spit out the two samples which you see up here, at low relative density. And again, down here shown for comparison are the effective stiffness values. You can do it not only for trusses, you can also do it for the spinal architectures. So what you see here on the right is an example for where we told the sample, please generate something that's as close to bone as possible. In fact, we gave it the base material properties, the stiffness of bone, which is why we matched the, the, the relative density of 30% almost exactly. The machine learning, uh, the, the networks, the trained networks tell us that it should be on the order of 31%. And again, the stiffness match is, is intriguing. Note that the training and use of the neural network knows nothing about bone. 
The only thing it knows is what trusses are and what these spinodal architectures are, but we never fed it any bone data beforehand. So we can use these very effectively to generate structures that have the effective properties, in this case, stiffness that we want. Going beyond stiffness is a huge challenge, and this is something we're tackling and trying to tackle at, the, at present. Now, one of the last comments I want to make scientifically here is that everything I've showed you so far was based on periodic designs or close to periodic designs. But we could go beyond that, and we could do a lot more. Now, I could spend an entire seminar on how we do this if we don't have periodic architectures. Instead, I'm just going to show you here quick examples. What you see at the bottom is an architecture that smoothly transitions from one truss architecture to another, both having very distinct mechanical properties. And this is what you would need if, for example, you want to design an implant, which has certain mechanical properties here, but distinct other mechanical properties down there. And we have ways to smoothly transition from one to another. The same you could do with the spinodal or spinodoid, as we coined them, architectures up here. Let's say if you want to change the pore size, if you want to change the elastic anisotropy from one end of the sample to the other, or even you know, in 2D and 3D, if you have a large sample and you know locally what your stiffness values are supposed to be, how do you smoothly transition in between? We have solutions also for that. And finally, of course, this is all connected to topology optimization. We could even pose the question, if you have a design space and you want it to satisfy a certain mechanical function, let's say you apply some loads and you apply some boundary conditions, how can we come up with a design that most, uh, in the best fashion, namely at lowest density and easily fabricable, uh, complies with those constraints? And uh, this is ongoing work, which was recently uh, published this year by Stan Telegram and Nola Sigmund. We try to do this in a topology optimization to scale fashion, meaning we make sure that there are manufacturable trusses at every point inside the sample, but we smoothly transition in between, both in terms of the architecture, the topology, but also the geometry from point to point. And the last thing I want to show you is that, this is the last example I have, if you have graded lattices, you can do a lot of things, not just you know, optimal loading, optimal stiffness, we can also go back to dynamics. I showed you previously how we can look at how waves spread in a continuous medium. And if you have a square type lattice as shown over here, we can use ray tracing to figure out how uh, waves move in all kinds of directions. Um, but if you now start to grade this lattice, let's say that the unit cell is not the same everywhere, but let's say that the unit cell changes size from one end to another. And that's what you see over here. There are large unit cells in the top right corners and the unit cell size changes dramatically from top to bottom and right to left. In this case, you can get waves which do not just spread in the typical fashion according to dispersion relations, but you can see how these waves are actually curved. They move around corners because they have to somehow comply with the pre-existing you know, spatial gradient of the architecture. And of course, this again is frequency dependent. At every frequency we saw wave motion is different. And we can use this very effectively. And uh, Charles Dorn up here uh, found a very nice technique from seismology, which is known as ray tracing, how we can find how these waves are steered through a spatially graded lattice. We can also use this, and that's ongoing work for the inverse challenge. So time's almost up. I tried to talk about a lot of trust properties that we can optimize, a lot of challenges, each of which we tried to come up with theoretical computational solutions, either with experiments in-house or with collaborators. And the closing comments I want to make here are the following. There are tremendous opportunities for tailoring material properties, far beyond what I could discuss here in the limited time. There's fascinating work about fracture toughness, especially in 3D, recently by Vikram Beshwande. There's great work on the strength of these, for example, by Lorenzo Valdevitz and the collaborators. Uh, there's interesting work also on looking at imperfections. No truss is perfect, fabrication induced or otherwise, there are imperfections. And many, like Damiano Pasini, have looked into this. Carlos Portela recently looked at high speed impact. Everything I showed you about waves only works if the wavelength is large compared to uh, you know, certain characteristic dimensions. But if you're shooting in hypervelocity impact, the whole scenario changes. Also, you can go to strongly nonlinear dynamics. And there are many people who have contributed to that, understanding solitary wave propagation, transition one uh, front motion, and so forth. So there's a wide range of opportunities for tailoring material properties beyond the limited range that I could show you. One point I would also want to make is that these architectural materials, I think, will not replace conventional materials. We're not going to be driving cars you know, made out of architectural materials five years from now or so, simply because the fabrication routes are so complicated or so costly. And this is not going to replace bulk materials like metals and composites and so forth. But 
they have given rise to very many exciting opportunities for specialized applications from you know wave steering and hearing ads all the way to uh, solar uh, sorry to to radar and sonar attenuation uh, layer, uh, um, uh, geez, I can't speak anymore, sound uh, insulation on the dynamic side, but also materials which are stiff and strong, uh, but absorb impact energy at the same time and low weight from shoe soles to personalized protection and whatnot. And one thing I find important is that this whole scheme of metamaterials or architected materials has fueled and fused scientific disciplines, I find. There's a lot of work here from structural mechanics that's partly re uh, rediscovered. We use a lot of concepts from dispersion relations um, <clears throat> all the way to nonlinear transition waves that we typically use in atomistics or in phase transformations. Topology optimization comes to the picture. There's many parts of the puzzle that have reconvened here, and I think it's been very, very efficient and very beneficial to, you know, fuel the disciplines, but also to fuse them to make people talk to each other who traditionally may not have. And last but not least, I think needless to say, there are many open challenges and opportunities in modeling, design, and especially fabrication. One thing I mentioned to you is that, uh, you know, there's scalability issues. And that's because typically if you have a periodic design, you print one unit cell after the other. If you're, if you're lucky, you print one layer after another. But that's basically it. How do you generate a meter-sized object which has small-scale features on the order of microns? And this is where these non-periodic architectures could be quite interesting. This was recent work with Carlos Platella, where we tried to use this phase separation process to generate structures which are actually on the centimeter scale, but have features on the micron scale. The problem with these is that you cannot easily design or manipulate the small scale architecture. This is really a problem for chemical engineers, if you ask me. But if these things become possible, then we have a whole new range of, of processing routes at our disposal, and that would be great. Now, the last thing I want to say, and for this, I step out literally um, and highlight those who have contributed to everything. First and foremost, these are the members of, of my lab, past and present, both at Caltech and now here for the past five years at ETH. Uh, we've had tremendous collaborators at Caltech, at Harvard, and also at BTU. And I'm sure there are others uh, who I forgot here, especially very many undergraduate students and others who have visited. And with this, I'll uh, stop uh, boring you with many materials, but I'll be very happy to you know, take questions or comments or anything you have. Thanks very much. <laughs>